Hello everyone, and welcome to this first lecture on mathematical modeling. Now, in this lecture, we're going to introduce the five-step method due to Mark Mearchart. And I think that this is a very, very important way that everybody should be approaching mathematical modeling. If you are an undergraduate, if you are a graduate, if you are a hobbyist, or even if you are a mathematical researcher, this is the important step-by-step -step process that you should be applying when doing anything related to modeling in mathematics. Now I said it's a five-step method. What are the five steps? Well, the first one is to ask the question. Of course, we have to know what the goal is here. We need something to be able to answer when it comes to our modeling. Okay, once we ask the question, the next thing that we are going to do is we are going to select the modeling approach. So, over the course of this lecture series, I'm going to introduce you to a number of different approaches. It will be, of course, up to you to figure out the best approach when you are doing this on your own. And of course, this is not uh, something that has a right answer. There are multiple different ways to model the same thing. So you're going to maybe use the approach that you are most comfortable with, that you feel is most applicable, or maybe the approach that captures the essence of the question that you are trying to ask. Once you have uh, selected a modeling approach, the next thing you will do is you will formulate the model. So once we have an approach, then I need to actually build the model. Well, once I have the model, I need to solve the model, of course, right? The only way that I'm gonna be able to answer the question is if I solve the model. Now, this might be through algebraic or uh, logical means or any number of ways that we use mathematics to solve problems. It could be with probabilistic means. You could tell me what the expected value of the outcome is going to be. But in some way, you want to move yourself towards number five, and that is answering the question, right? So the first thing that we do is we ask ourselves a question. We have something that we want to capture with our mathematical model. Of course, every single step is going to pull us towards actually being able to answer that question. Okay, now that we've got it, Let's do a simple little example here, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna think back to the introductory video from the last, uh, from the previous video, and we're gonna think about that ABCs. Remember I said it's making assumptions and borrowing and criticizing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a very, very, very simple example. And we are going to make so many assumptions on this that it kind of becomes useless. We're going to start, sort of criticize it, and then we're going to maybe loosen some of those assumptions to make things a little more realistic. But it all starts with a question. Okay, so here's the problem. Okay, so here's my example that I want to give you. I am sitting on a ski lift. So it's winter in Montreal right now and I went skiing over the break, I sat on the ski lift, and my goggles fell to the ground. I am currently 10 meters above the ground. The question that I will ask you, so one question, when do the goggles hit the ground? Okay, so I have a clearly uh, explained question here. Okay, so remember, I'm sitting on the ski lift, 10 meters above the ground, I drop my goggles, and they fall straight down into the snow. How long does it take for them to fall? This is a clear question that has, at least in theory, a clear answer. Well, so we've got number one ticked off here. Let's go for another one. Let's go for two. We need to select a modeling process. Now. Before we can start talking about how we're going to model this thing, we should start by listing off what we know and what we have. Well, first of all, the question is for, uh, asked in terms of time. 
how long or when do things hit the ground. That means that clearly we will have a variable for time. So let's say let t equal to time. Now, this is going to be in seconds, but let's keep moving on. Okay, so I've got an independent variable, time. What else do I have? Well, I could have the position of the goggles above the ground. So let's say let y, which is a function of time, y of t, uh, be the position, so be the position of the goggles from the ground. So, and then from ground, and this is going to be in meters. So I'm going to use an M here for meters. I'll use an S here for seconds. Okay, I've got time and I've got a position. Well, we know from introductory calculus that derivatives relate us to say the velocity. So let's say, let V be the velocity. of the goggles. And of course, this is in meters per second. It's a rate. Again, the way that we know it's in meters per second, you think about, say, your, your Leibniz rule. Uh, v is equal to dy by dt. Y is in meters. T is in seconds. That's where this sort of fraction is coming in. Then also, of course, if we have this, then we have acceleration as well. So let's let A be the acceleration of the goggles. And this is in meters per second squared. Okay. So what we can see here, based on my notation, is that t is going to be the independent variable. It's the only thing that is independent of everything else. But you can see that we have y of t, v of t, and a of t. These are the dependent variables. They all depend on time. Now there's one other thing that we have, and it is a constant. It is not a variable, right? These are all functions. Uh, t is an independent variable, the dependent variables are functions. We have one constant and we will call it g and this is the acceleration due to gravity. To gravity. Alright, so we're falling down. This should be something that we knew that we would have to consider in this. This is 9.8 806 meters per second squared. I'm going to make it negative and that indicates to us that the downward direction is negative. Okay, so this is of course, you know, happening at sea level, this acceleration due to gravity, uh, but what I have tabulated here is essentially a physics problem, right? We can see that we have all of these physical quantities and we have a little more information on top of that. Remember, we haven't even got to selecting the modeling approach, but it should be becoming a little bit more clear to you. But what else do we know here? We know that initially we're 10 meters above the ground. So at t equal to zero, y of zero, sorry, is equal to 10. They're initially 10 meters off the ground and Again, picture me sitting in the ski lift. I take my goggles and I drop them. I didn't throw them, I dropped them. Now, what does that mean for the velocity? The velocity is initially zero. They, were, they fell off with no initial velocity. Okay, so now I've tabulated all of the information that I have here. I need to select a modeling uh, approach. Well, in this case, it's clear that this should be done as a physics problem, right? I have all of these physical quantities. I have acceleration due to gravity. Now, one other thing that I will do is I will make some assumptions on my model. 
So two as well. So this is continued. I'm gonna make some assumptions. Again, I haven't produced a model yet, but I have a pretty good idea of how things are going to go. But I need to put a few assumptions on this. First of all, the acceleration is constant. Okay. Again, think about the ABCs. Maybe this is a place where we can do some criticism later. And let's say no other forces. So there's forces. We know that this is a physics problem. We can see that word coming out of it. So no other forces are acting on the goggles. Okay. So that means things like there's no wind that's going to be blowing us around. Uh, there's not going to be any air resistance that might be coming through here, right? We are completely imagining this sort of happening in a, a vacuum that has some sort of gravity that's pulling us to the floor. Okay, so a massive amount of assumptions. We already know, right? I have, I'm not really considering a physically relevant problem, but that's okay. That's where the C step, the criticism step is going to come in here, all right? I can criticize this. But let's at least produce a model and let's see what happens. Okay, let's look at number three, formulate the model. Okay, so first of all, we know that there is a deep connection between all of these variables that comes from physics. First of all, we know that the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, which is the second derivative of the position. Right? This is something that we learn in an introductory calculus class and we're sort of, it's alluded to early on uh, in our maybe high school mathematics or high school physics classes. Okay, now let's take a look at the assumptions. I've got this assumption right here and it says that acceleration is constant and the only thing that's acting on me is gravity which I already know the acceleration due to gravity. So this tells me that A is equal to negative 9.806. Okay, that tells me that my derivative of my velocity is negative 9.806. So now I have what's called a differential equation. That is an equation with a derivative in it. I could even put a second derivative here. This could be uh, the second derivative of y with respect to t is equal to 9.806. But nonetheless, I've got an equation or a model that I am going to work with here. So the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to solve it. Okay, let's try and solve this thing. Well, I mean, this doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to be able to work through. This is a nice, easy uh, little calculus problem. All I need to do is compute some antiderivatives here, right? A little bit of integration. So the first thing that I can see is that if I undo this derivative here, I get the velocity on the left-hand side. Integrating a constant function, that gives me a linear function t, and don't forget that constant of integration. The question is, what is the constant of integration? Well, I've got a little bit of information down here. I know that the initial velocity of my, uh, of my goggles is zero. So if the initial velocity is equal to zero, this is going to give me that when I plug in zero here, I get zero is equal to 9.806 times zero, that's when t is equal to zero, plus c. This gives me that c is equal to zero, which tells me clearly that v of t is equal to 9.806t. So a nice linear function, right? Just a cons uh, constant acceleration, a linear velocity in the downward direction. And now you probably know where this is gonna go because the next step 
is just using the fact that y of t, I'm uh, sorry, the derivative of y of t, so the velocity, sorry, is equal to the derivative of y of t, which is equal to 9.806t. Now, again, it's just a nice, easy integration problem. Just take the antiderivative here. This is gonna give me y of t is equal to now 9.806 divided by two t squared. That's coming from the square term coming up here. And don't forget about it, constant of integration. Okay, so this is the same as negative 4.903 t squared plus d. So all I did was just divided that thing by two, make it one nice number, that's good for us. Question is, how do I find d? Well, it's exactly the same as what we did with the velocity. We initially knew that we were 10 meters above the ground. So y of zero is equal to 10. What does this give me? Well, this is going to give me that 10 is equal to uh, negative 4.903 times zero squared plus d. This thing entirely goes to zero because it's being multiplied by zero. And this gives me d is equal to 10, which gives me that my position of my goggles as a function of time is equal to negative 4.903 t squared plus 10. That is the equation for the position of my goggles above the ground. And now that I've got the equation, I've solved the model, all that I need to do, sorry, this is number five. All that I need to do is answer the question. So what was the question? The question is, when do the goggles hit the ground? Well, how can I answer the question? I can answer the question by solving when y is equal to zero. So when is y of t equal to zero. Okay, well, this is just going to give us, well, this will give us uh, zero is equal to negative 4.903 t squared plus 10, which you can easily find t is equal to the square root of 10 over 4.903. Now, of course, I'm taking the positive square root here because time is going forward. Clearly, my goggles did not travel backwards in time and hit the ground. Of course, time is flowing in the positive direction, so I'm going to be taking that positive root. And if you're curious what this is, something like 1.42, something along those lines. So about, you know, one and a half seconds, this thing hits the ground. And that's how we wrap it up, right? We were given a question, Question is, when do the goggles hit the ground? We can provide an answer. We can say at approximately 1.42 seconds, the goggles will hit the ground. Okay, so we figured out when the goggles are gonna hit the ground, but the question is, was that actually a good representation of reality? Again, remember that we made some critical assumptions, right? There are no other uh, forces acting upon our goggles and the acceleration is constant. Well, now we're at that C step of the ABCs of math modeling. Now we're at a position where we can criticize. Now, there is no place on earth where we are, unless you are in a vacuum, of course, uh, where we are not going to be affected by air resistance. So clearly, what we had as our mathematical model is not going to be that physically realistic because we neglected air resistance. So this is the iteration process that you get when you do mathematical modeling in the real world. You start with something simple that you know you can solve. That's what we did with the previous example. Then you go back and you bootstrap it. You add in something that might make it slightly more complicated but more realistic. And you see what you can do with that. So let's do it again. 
Let's look at another example here. Exactly the same problem, but now let's account for air resistance. Well, in this case, we can have exactly the same question. The question is going to be, you know, when does the model hit, or sorry, when does the goggles hit the ground? The assumptions that we will make will be now that we include air resistance, and so let's jump right up to the model. In this case, the model will be the acceleration is, so it's still constant, 9.806. That's the acceleration due to gravity. But in this case, we're going to add in an air resistance term. Okay, so my air resistance term is coming in as a multiple of the absolute value of the velocity to some power. Now, this is significantly more complicated, right? The value of C might be able to be measured, say, in a laboratory. In our case, we're just going to leave it as it is right now. The value of alpha is going to vary potentially. Typically, it sits somewhere between 1 and 4. Okay, so we don't know exactly what this is. Maybe these things can be measured experimentally, but this is how you would add in, uh, add in air resistance. And again, this goes to the B in ABCs of mathematical modeling. We are borrowing from well-known physical laws. Okay, well, we can actually put this as a function entirely in terms of V by noting that the acceleration is the derivative of V. And now we can see that we've got ourselves into an ordinary differential equation. In particular, this is a very specific and special kind of ordinary differential equation. It is what's known as a separable differential equation. Now I have done lectures and videos on uh, separable differential equations. I'll put some links in the description. Uh, but what I want you to note here is that I can take this dt and I can put it up here and I can put all the v's on the left side. This leaves me with dv over negative 9.806 plus c times the absolute value of v to the alpha and this is just equal to dt. And the way separation of variable works is it asks me to integrate both sides. And so what I get here is t plus c, of course, the integration constant c. The left side is an integral entirely in terms of v, but unfortunately, I don't know what the answer is for general values of alpha and c. So now you can see what the problems we encounter when it comes to mathematical modeling is. All I did was make it slightly more realistic and now I'm in a position where I can't get the answer. This is very, very frustrating, right? I don't have a way of saying, okay, no matter what the value of alpha is, this is the answer. So now what I need to do is put a little bit more of an assumption on this thing. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to sort of loosen things up a little bit. Okay, so what I would like to do is I would like to say, let's set c times the absolute value of v alpha equal to minus v, uh, just minus v, sorry, minus c times v. Okay, so what I did is I took alpha equal to 1 here. Velocity is always negative in our case because we are falling downwards. That's why my absolute value turns into negative v. Okay, so if you're wondering where that negative came from, you take the absolute value of a negative number, that's the same as multiplying a negative number by minus one, okay? So that's where this is coming from. This is telling us that wind resistance is acting in the opposite direction of the uh, acceleration due to gravity. Okay, we can keep the C in there pretty generally, and now let's take a look at what we've got. Well, this gives me the integral of dV over now, uh, negative 9.806 minus c times v. And this can actually uh, be solved. In fact, this gives me minus 1 over c. The minus is coming from pulling that minus out of both of these. And then the natural logarithm of cv plus 9.806. 
06. And I will remind you that these two things are equal, right? So this is actually equal to t plus c. We already figured out the integral over here. Well, now it's a fun little rearrangement problem, but nothing more. So in fact, therefore, the velocity, in this case, v of t, is equal to, so let's take a look at this. If you rearrange this expression, so you're going to need to take an exponential of both sides to get rid of the logarithm. But this is something you can handle, right? This is just a computation problem. This is going to be 9.8. 6 divided by c again c can be anything we want it could be one it could be pi it could be a million we're doing this completely generally and then e to the uh, minus c times t and then uh, plus one minus one and what this is doing is this is also accounting for the fact that v of zero is equal to zero. So this uh, integration constant here gives you this 9.806 that's sitting up front. So I did two steps in one here. That's okay, try and work it out yourself. The purpose is now I've got an expression. This thing is negative because this exponential has a negative power on it and I'm subtracting one off of it. So now that I've got my model, I can ask myself, well, what is my position as a function of time? Remember, that was the whole purpose of this. That's how I answered the, the problem originally. Well, the position now can be obtained by integrating this again. So again, this is an, a fun little calculus exercise, really nothing more. You're going to have to use the fact that y of 0 is equal to 10. So I'm going to skip some steps. I just want to give you the model so we can talk about it. But in this case, now I get negative 9.806 divided by c. And then 1 over c e to the minus ct uh, plus t. All right, so the minus here, that's been pulled out. The minus came from the integration here so both of those terms are negative and then plus well then we've got this annoying sort of constant term on here 9.806 over c squared so it looks ugly but that's just because we allowed c to be general right so you can put in any value of c that you want and you can still find a uh, a a solution to this right that's just a function you could plot it if you wanted to uh, but that's about as good as it's going to get. So now the question is, how do you answer this problem? Again, just by potentially, you know, adding in air resistance, we saw that we already had to simplify things so that we could actually solve it mathematically, right, using separation of variables. Now I've got this annoying exponential problem, and I need to solve, so to answer, so to answer the question, I need to solve y of capital T equal to zero. Remember, you want to know when the goggles hit the ground. This is something I want you to be very, very careful of while progressing through this class. Keep in mind what the purpose of doing all this is. We went way down the rabbit hole here into mathematics. Don't forget what the whole purpose was. How are you going to answer this question? Well. Unfortunately, answering this question is very, very difficult, right? Look at this equation that we have right here. Even if I gave you a specific value of C, this is still requiring you to solve what's called a transcendental equation. That means it is an equation that involves both polynomials and exponential functions in this case. So 10 plus 9.8. 6 over c squared is equal to 0. That's not great, right? It's not that easy to work with, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, you know, the best thing that we can do is we can try and plug in values of c, maybe, and hand this off to a computer. 
So again, mathematics does not happen in a vacuum, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants, and some of those giants were people who gave us the computer. So at this point, now we can hand this off to a computer. I will just offer up a few little sketches of what this looks like. So please, please pardon my, my drawings here. Uh, basically, you're starting at 10 at every case. So this is y of t on the vertical axis. Now, when c was equal to 0, we had that nice little parabolic arc, right? So that was something that came down. And it hit y equal to 0. Uh, this was around like 1.42, remember. So what we see for other values, so if you try and plot this function, what you're going to see is something that looks like this. So maybe this is for uh, c equal to 0.5. So um, let's go with, I'm going to say this is c equal to 0 0.5. And then maybe c equal to 1 is going to take a little bit longer. So you can try plotting these on your own, maybe using Desmos. But c equal to Let's say, let's do one more, 1.5. So this is C is equal to 1.5 and so on and so forth. Now, what's the general thing that you're seeing, the general trend here? The higher the value of C, the longer it takes to hit the ground. Now, how do we understand that physically? Well, that makes sense, right? Because as we see here, Air resistance is pushing us sort of upwards. The force is acting in the opposite direction that gravity is taking us. Now, if there is no air resistance, nothing is pushing us up. We are just getting complete free fall. But for any other value of C that's positive here, we're getting a little bit of push upwards. So as much as you want to fall down, you're getting a little tiny push. And what it's doing is it's causing you to hit the ground a little bit later. The more air resistance, the more C, the longer it takes to hit the ground, okay? That's what this is doing. So this is something that we can do with mathematical modeling. We, even though we weren't able to completely solve this, we made some simple assumptions to get something that's natural, right? We understand this. The higher the air resistance, the longer it takes to hit the ground. Now, of course, we didn't fully answer the problem. You could do this numerically if you knew the values, say, of C that you were going to use here. But nonetheless, this is capturing a much more realistic phenomenon than not including the air resistance in this. So now what you've seen is the five-step method to mathematical modeling. This is what you should be carrying with you every time you do a modeling problem, okay? You should be internalizing that five-step method. You should be thinking to yourself, okay, what is the question? You know, how am I, what is my modeling approach? How do I formulate the model? How do I solve the model? And how do I answer the question? That should be your five-step thought process as you go through. Now, I also gave you the ABCs of modeling. We can keep those in mind. As we move through this class, we can think about the assumptions that we've made, what we can borrow. So in, in this case, we borrowed from physics, telling us how air resistance affects a falling object. And then we can criticize at the end. Remember, when we didn't have air resistance, we said, mm, this doesn't seem right, right? There's just, we, we assume too little here. And now we can see that criticism left us with a model that was maybe a little too hard to understand, but nonetheless, our sort of computational approach here gave us, you know, that intuition that we were looking for. Okay, in the next video, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about mathematical modeling, sort of types of mathematical modeling, uh, and things that we can build into models. And then from there, we're going to talk a little bit about non-dimensionalization, so getting rid of units. Okay, I'll see you in the next video, everybody.